Do you know a man once said to me, Keith, you're a preacher, you can spend the day in prayer, you want to come and get in my boots. There's no possibility of praying like that. I'm a businessman and I've got to run. I can't pray like that. I said, you're a liar. You're a liar. He got such a shock, he began to weep. I said, you know what's the tragedy of you is you're lying to yourself. That's a lie. There's no such a thing as no time for God. And sell your business, sir. Change your job, sir, if you have no time for God. You're not in the will of God. God will give you a better job. But don't you dare neglect God for work or money, business or money. He came back to me, you know. I think it was a year afterwards and said, Keith, you were right. I started being ruthless and put aside things that didn't matter, that didn't matter, that I thought didn't matter, and there was so much that didn't matter that I found all the time I needed for God on earth. And now for the first time in life I'm walking with God. Don't lie to yourself and say to be ruthless. You don't need people like you need God. Be ruthless. You're not neglecting your wife if you're not always with her. I'll tell you what. Don't neglect God and the little bit of time you give your wife, she'll treasure for all eternity. But neglect God and give your wife all the time you think she needs, she'll curse you. In her heart, so will your children. And your work won't be blessed. I'm not talking about prospering, but the devil will tell you, the work, the work, the work. Let me tell you, sir, the five hours you think you need for that work, watch God do it in one hour if you don't neglect him. Don't neglect God. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Oh, he weeps, saying that. Don't doubt it. By the time you say that word about you, he weeps. He weeps like no man ever wept for you. He didn't only weep on earth, sir. Don't tell me it's an emotionalism I'm bringing now. If Christ wept on earth, he weeps now in heaven. Don't you doubt that he's no different in character or heart or compassion or patience or mercy or hurt. Every branch in me that bringeth not forth fruit. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it. Isn't it lovely? Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. But every branch that beareth fruit, the moment there's fruit, the moment there's reality, he doesn't wait. He purgeth it. He purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word. I love that. Which I have spoken unto you. Now comes the most important vital verse in the entire Bible for a Christian. There's nothing more vital for God to say to a Christian than this verse. You can go through the Bible 400 times and you'll still agree with me. There's no verse God holds out to the Christian as vital as this. So listen carefully now. Abide in me. That's a command. And I in you. Abide in me. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. Don't do that now, but you've got to do one thing. Trust while anything comes in you, whatever comes. But do this one thing only every day of life. This is your one priority of life. Don't eat. But do this. You have more chance of survival not eating food than not doing this. Don't doubt that. Abiding in me. Abiding in me. This is the one thing you do to survive and out of it will come fruit. No matter what comes upon you that God allows will just be fruit and fruit and fruit and fruit and fruit. It isn't that God isn't purging or doesn't want to and isn't busy with you. But if you're not doing this, no matter what he does, it will all be ruined. So you take care. Now this is your your responsibility abide in me I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except that abide in the vine no more can ye except ye abide in me I am the vine ye are the branches he that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit don't doubt it God knows how to bring it he knows how to bring it trust him now the same bringeth forth much fruit for without me ye can do nothing nothing don't doubt it don't try to do anything for Jesus apart from abiding in him. 
Don't try to preach. Don't try to do anything apart from abiding in him. You can do nothing apart from this. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch withered. Men gather them, cast them into the fire. They are burned. Abide in me, I in you. You know, John wrote these words that he heard Jesus said, but then John preached. Oh, he was a great preacher. Do you want to know how God expounded through this man? Turn to 1 John, the first epistle of John. The first letter of John. He that saith, he abideth in him. He that saith, he does the one thing Christ cried out, you have to do for anything of any value to happen in Christianity. Without this, you have no ability. Nothing can ever happen in your life of any value unless you do this. And this is your part. He that saith, he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. Abide in Jesus and you become like Jesus. You have to. God will make sure of that. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. Do you as a result of abiding in Christ? It doesn't end there. The same chapter 2 verse 28. Now little children abide in him. Why? He always tells us why. That when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed. You better tell people, no matter what your theology, abide in him, little children, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed. Before him at his coming. Chapter 3, verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Oh my. It's not talking about sinless perfection, by the way. But let me tell you something. There's no victory in Jesus apart from abiding in him. You want victory, young man. You want victory, young girl. You've got to learn the one thing. You can come out in meetings a thousand times and bow down for every single thing the holiness movement or any other movement can bring about being filled with the spirit and the victory you can come out to the day you die but until you get up from your knees and I don't despise any encounter with God or meeting or absolute surrender that Andrew Murray says is so vital to be filled with the spirit and controlled by the spirit but let me tell you whatever you come out unless you determine from that moment to the day you die you will always lose ground you will always unless you determine to do this as the greatest priority in life abiding in Christ that's your part This is a discipline. It is the greatest discipline in life of communing with God. There's nothing that matters more than communing with God. Don't doubt that. But who does it cost? Because there's nothing more the devil does to try and keep you away from anything in life than this. You think your sins are what the devil did. Your sins were the result of what the devil did by keeping you from the quiet time. If you didn't miss the quiet time, you wouldn't have 90% of the failures of your life. If you didn't miss getting into God, getting abiding in such a way that you don't leave him behind when you open the door to leave the closet. You've met with him in such a way that when you open the door, you walk with him through the day. That's a quiet time. Anything less is a lie. If you fall asleep on your knees, don't ever get on your knees again. Don't lie. Don't waste time. Do what works. Half an hour alive, vital with God is better than two hours lying to yourself that you're communing with God. If in this morning and this entire day and yesterday and the day before, I don't care who you are, professor of theology, doctor of theology, I don't care if you're the world's greatest preacher. If the quiet time is not intact, you're a grief to God. You're as real as your quiet time, no matter who you are on earth. You're not as real as your testimony was 20 years ago or one week ago. You are as real as your quiet time. You want to know five, ten things of what it is, what's vital reality? Nothing, just one thing, the quiet time. The ten things are the result of the quiet time. Take away the quiet time, take away the communing, take away the abiding in Christ. And you're left with nothing that God can do for you. Nothing. Though you're the greatest orator on earth, suddenly you're standing in the pulpit without God. And I fear nothing more in life than to stand in the pulpit without God. Preacher, don't get in the pulpit until you've soaked yourself in prayer. Until you're sure you're abiding with him, come with him from the presence of God. Oh, don't come at all. Don't dare. 
There's no such a dangerous place in the world than the preacher to be alone in the proof of his own abilities. He does the work of the devil. He means the greatest theologian on earth. You need God in the pulpit or don't get in the pulpit. You need God. Without him you can do nothing. And there's one way, the abiding. The abiding is not an act of faith or relying on yesterday's quiet time or the day before or a week. Today is how real you are. You're as real as your quiet time. Don't doubt it. My daddy, when he was saved, he shook us. He shook the world, my daddy. We looked at him, we trembled. I shook, I trembled, I wept at my daddy's life. What made him so godly that our, our nation still hasn't recovered from what God did in his life? My daddy was one of the holiest men of God that ever lived on earth. Don't doubt that. And I worship God, I have the right to say it. But what made him, what made him that as he walked, men just trembled and wept. Sometimes in their scores, just standing, weeping at the holiness of this man. Why? One thing, he never neglected the quiet time. From the day he was saved to the day he died, Daddy was consumed with prayer. His quiet time, this, this, the seeking God, this communing with God, consumed his life. He consumed his life and everything in life just centered on being alone with Jesus. When he walked away from that, men wept. Men wept. Will they ever weep at your life? Ever? You think being a great theologian is going through great degrees and studying? No. The little bit you've got with the vital reality of communing with God will shake the world. When will we come back to the quiet time? You three years of quiet time. We shook once when Daddy had visitors about a few weeks after we saw him turn to God. I was young. And the visitors sat and they sat a little long and Daddy got up and he began to weep. And we thought, what is this? We all got up. Daddy says, forgive me. I don't want to offend you. But I have to go. I have to go. Point of Stay with my children. Stay with my wife. But forgive me, I have a meeting with Jesus Christ I cannot miss. You see, if I don't go now, he said, and he was battling to say this, he didn't want to impress, he just had to get away. If I don't go now, I won't be able to spend so much time with God, and if I don't spend that much of time, I won't be able to sleep my conscience. And if I don't go to sleep by this time, I won't be able to get up at this time. If I don't get up at this time to spend this much time with God, I can't walk with God through the day. I won't be able to walk with God. I'll fail God. I know how much time and for the reason that I can walk with God and not be a grief to God and man. Forgive me, I have to go to God now. And he escaped. Everyone wept, you know. My mother nearly died of fright. And what he did to the... We have to bring her water, you know. What he did to the guests. But mommy, mommy didn't die of shame after that. We noticed the next time he had to do it. Not many people ever dared do it. From then onwards... But some of the world's greatest preachers have been in my home. I don't know why God ever honored us so much. But no matter who it was, Daddy would get up and leave with the same words. Sometimes less. Always battling to have to say it. If people kept him from God and he had to excuse himself. People stood, you know, and they wept and said, I've never known a man on earth. And no one keeps him from God. Nothing keeps him from Jesus Christ. Nothing makes him miss. Are you like that? Nothing! Nothing will make you miss God. My mother never wept after that. She never choked in embarrassment. My mother stood like someone standing to attention with such respect as she saw my father go because she knew this is why he is holy and other Christians are not holy. Don't doubt it. You're as real as your quiet time. You're as real as your quiet time. Don't doubt it. My children knocking at the door when they boys, Daddy, it's too late. You can't stay. Come, Daddy. And I stood there, but I'm not finished with God and they got angry. I said, little... Listen, just once in your life, listen that you never ask me again. Don't ever knock on this door again till the day I die. Unless someone is dying, don't ever, ever disturb me again. Now listen, because I never have to tell you this again. Let me tell you why, boys. Because if I miss this time, if I hurry this time, I can't be to you what you would want to the Father. You'll start weeping because of my life. I can take you to children who have, whose fathers are preachers across the world, my boys, whose children weep. Those children weep because of the ungodliness of that man. He can preach, he can impress the crowds, but he can't live it in the home. And as you're real as you are in your home, so if it doesn't work out there, it works out nowhere. I can take you, my boys, to wives across who have some of the greatest preachers' names in the world that impress men. 
and their wives do nothing but weep because of the unchrist like this. The un Your mother will soon weep through my life if I miss it. If I miss it just once, boys, it might give me the opportunity and the chance to miss it again. I've never missed God. I've never hurried God. No matter who's waiting, no matter what's happening, I can't. Don't make me miss once. Your mother will start weeping. The only reason I can be to her what you would want me to be to her and make her happy is this time, boys. They never, ever knocked on the door again. But I noticed my boys started never missing God. Midnight after their studies, still and I say, listen, boy, you're tired. You've studied too much. God doesn't expect this of you. Get to bed and get some sleep. And he said, Daddy, if I miss just once, it might mean I miss again. I don't want to do it, Daddy. Do you think I was too cruel to them? No, thank God. They'll never miss God. You're as real as your quiet time. You're as safe as your quiet time. I have people across my nation have fallen in sin who in the pulpits. Oh, this is the day and age where the pulpits to be shamed. As never before in the history of the church, this is the moment. Everywhere, everywhere. Don't doubt it. You say we mustn't preach it. What's in the front pages of the newspapers, man? Why don't preach it? We need to tell them why. Why? So many men of the greatest, the greatest preachers of the denominations are falling into sin and bringing such shame upon the church as thousands stagger over them who they brought to Christ. You cannot believe how many preachers have fallen into sin from the evangelical, even the holiness churches that used to be so stable and consistent. There's no one that can point a finger and say it's theirs, denominations, every denomination, the greatest preachers are falling. Why? You know, when they call me, they fly me across the country and I say, no, no, I sat at his feet. I could never face a man. I could never. They say, you're coming. For some reason, they make this poor man get in the plane and they're right to go and they leave me and everybody forsakes me. And there sits a man who's led 40,000 to Christ. Staggered the world with his abilities. God was so with him. And you know what I do? I just weep. I weep and I weep and I weep and I weep and I weep. And some of those men only start weeping when they see someone weeping like me. Then they start weeping at the shame. Some of them, their wives take guns and shoot themselves dead at the shame. And suddenly they find their husbands are in such sin. You know what I've done? I've never ever asked them what went wrong. I've never ever said what went wrong. I've told them. I've told them you neglected God. This could never have happened. The devil cannot touch you. He cannot touch you if you don't neglect God. You became such a mighty man of God because you were consumed in prayer and communing with God in the Bible. That was your life. That was your source of everything that happened. But I guarantee you there came a day you neglected God, probably for the work of God. And the work of God became your sin. That woman isn't your sin. You had a greater sin. That woman would have never happened if you didn't have a greater sin. Your great sin is you neglected God for the work of God. I guarantee you the devil watched you. He watched you through the years and he said, I can't touch this man. I can't do anything. I cannot touch him because you just met with God. I know that if you had enough to ask it. But I guarantee you there came a day the devil sat up and looked at you as you began to neglect God for the work of God and you thought you could get away. Then the devil sat and I guarantee you he said, now I'm going to get him. And he got you. He got you. You know what they've all said without exception? Not word perfect. God sent you, boy. I didn't even know until you spoke now. But that is my greatest sin. It was the work of God I got too busy with. And it became my greatest sin. Every other sin that's resulted is that sin. It's a terrible sin to try and abide in this world without abiding in Christ. It's a terrible, terrible grief to God and you will become a grief to man. You're as safe as your quiet time. You're as safe as your quiet time. You're as real as your quiet time. Now, beloved, the devil's watching you and he's trembling. And so is God watching you and he's waiting. He'll be there for the meeting. The only one that will miss the meeting place is you. You'll miss the appointment. God won't. Every one of you that God is confronting, I don't care if you're the greatest preacher in America sitting here today. Be real. I want every one of you that neglect God to say, God, 
forgive me for the sins that have resulted but for the greater sin that caused these other sins that are in my life now and before I'm destroyed God I'm not going another step God I come for mercy and cleansing the blood from this grief I've been to thee by neglecting God himself for other things I come for cleansing in the blood but I come also with everything in my being to ask thee for the grace the grace Lord that from this day till the day I die I will never neglect God again I will never neglect God for anything not even for the work of God no matter who it is standing there over me God will deal with him but I have to seek God I want every one of you that neglect God to stand right now and say it's me God Every one of you, will you bow your heads, please? Will you pray after me, O oh God? Have mercy on me. For the grief I have given thee. Forgive me. Wash me in the blood of Christ. Through and through. All the sins I've done. that were the result of this sin please forgive me for but by thy grace I will never neglect thee again God not for anyone on earth teach me to pray that I may stay in tune with God and man in Jesus Christ's name Amen